All right, I think I'm live. I should be live. Um, yes, it says I'm live for the past 13 seconds or whatever. I'm still messing with some of this. Some of my new fancy tools, like my coloring. Oh, that's too red. I don't know. But, um, welcome everybody to another, uh, I don't know, meet and greet, get out the vote. Today is pretty much the last day before election day. Tomorrow is election day. Um, we have 24 hours, I believe, until the polls close. I wanted to try and discuss whatever I can and connect with anybody that I can. People who are interested or still curious about who to pick. Maybe you just got your ballot. Maybe you just opened up your ballot and you see three names for Lodi City Council District 5. One of them, one of them is me, Hector Madrigal or Hector Madrigal. Um, the other two, of course, are Mikey Hothi and Mike McKnight, my two competitors. Um, so in terms of what makes us different, because, you know, that's pretty much what everybody wants to know um, when they're choosing a, a representative. And I guess the difference between me and the others is that I have been looking into what other states, what other cities around California have been doing um, to solve some of the common issues around cities and around California. Um, because I believe one of the, well, primary job of a representative is to identify issues that, uh, that are around you that you have responsibility to, to deal with. And once you identify it, then you need to provide a solution and of course, there are many solutions to just one problem. So before you implement this solution, or you, even before you put it forth, you have to do an extensive amount of research to make sure it will fit properly within your area. Because sometimes a certain uh, a certain resolution to a problem might not f or might fit in one city and might not fit in in another. Not all cities are the same, or are or or are equal. <laughs> um, so anyways um, I've just been looking at different things over the past several months um, because I d really didn't think I was going to jump into the election until well until this year as I've said before uh, the reason I really jumped into the race was because I just didn't like how all of our representatives handled this pandemic we were supposed to look to them as you know uh, smart smart people, the great politicians who have either knowledge or experience on what to do and how to handle all these problems that affect all of us. Some of them have, some of these representatives have been in office for literally decades because there are no term limits on the federal level and in, in Congress. Um, and then there's sometimes there's not term, lim term limits on the local level. Um, so I was just annoyed uh, of these politicians who are like, oh yeah, I know exactly what to do. And then this happens and they're like, I don't know what to do. And then the whole city breaks down, everybody freaks out um, because they're supposed to be those who are responsible. They're supposed to be in the leadership position. Everybody looks to them. I'm not sp speaking just on the local level, not speaking just on the state level. I'm not speaking just on the federal level. I was really disappointed by everyone, all the politicians. And that's why I was like, okay, I'm jumping in. Um, we need to just settle the dust. We, it's not, it's not useful to just blame this side for that, this, or blame this side for doing whatever, blame that side for doing whatever. Especially in local politics, it is not a side, it is not a party. If we have some politicians running all up on a party, I don't know if they really have the well-being of the city in mind. It's not a left or right issue. It's not a Democrat or Republican issue. We're just looking out for the city and the rep or the uh, citizens of the city as representatives. So um, that's really why I jumped into this race. You know, I got I got to help out the people, and it was really the people that I was thinking of first and foremost. I know a lot of uh, representatives all around the country seen this um, this pandemic and thought I need to get in and help the businesses or people aren't making enough money and I, I, I don't want to hate and I understand 
that you can't really live much of a life, you can't have a, a house over your head, things of that nature without money. So we still need an economy. We still need to help these, these jobs, these businesses. But that wasn't the first thing that came into my head and why I needed to jump in the race. I was thinking, we need to help these people. We need to help all of Lodi, the citizens of Lodi, because there is a viral outbreak that might affect the health of the people. It didn't matter, Democrat, Republican, whatever. I never really identified with the parties. I've been saying that multiple times. And um, a little bit more about me. I know my, I might look young, fresh-faced. <laughs> um, I'm actually 33 years old, as I've mentioned before. So some people might think I'm just inexperienced just because of my facial looks or whatever. I have um, quite a bit of experience, I, I would say, in different different areas. We're not all experienced in everything, of course. Um, I've been studying political science and law over in college, over at Delta College, and I'm still studying political science and law over at um, California State University in Sacramento. Um, I'm really not sure if I'm going to go to law school after the university, possibly. I'm still not 100% sure on that. But um, I'm still very knowledgeable in all this, and I'm still st um, researching a lot of different things because that is, as I mentioned, that's one of the primary jobs of a representative to do a lot of research before you just prove something or say, yeah, I'm going with this, I'm going with that. You got to do some research. So that's knowledgeable in that area. I've also um, pretty much all my jobs, well, not all, most of my jobs <laughs> were working with the public. So I'm always straight hands on face to face with the public, just speaking with the public, helping them out. Um, you know, I mostly worked retail, but in addition to the retail job, I have done a lot of um, technical writing, I guess you can say. Um, so I've, I have a lot of tech experience, a lot of writing, a lot of organization, a lot of documents in that, in that way. So I guess you can say I have uh, office experience or whatever, I don't know. Um, personal experience, um, I have, well actually I don't think I've mentioned it in any of these live stream videos on this page, but I did mention it in a live stream video that I had with uh, Pastor Nelson. He's uh, one of the heads and founders of A New Lodi, which is an organization that is trying to bring uh, communities that are, that are kind of underprivileged, trying to bring them together and have a real solid community here in Lodi and working together. and. That's one of the things that I'm definitely focusing on, you know, community forward, community centered, people forward and people, people centered. I'm getting a little off track. Um, anyways, in a conversation with Pastor Nelson, I just talked a little bit about my history here in Lodi. You know, I've lived in Lodi for the past 24 years. Um, we moved here at the end of 1996. Um, I think it was September of 96. But, um... It was like right after we moved here, there were some, some like uh, racial incidents. I guess you can say, that was when they, when some people burned lawns, or burned crosses on the lawn of Toke High School, and spray painted the N word all over the school because uh, I believe the principal was one of the first black principals or something of that nature. And um, I didn't remember this. My mother actually told me because, you know, I just say a bunch of things as a kid, I suppose. Maybe I didn't, I just didn't really think about it. Apparently, my mother asked why we didn't celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day in Lodi. And then all these things happened. And then an organization was founded like right after that, because I believe the cross burning was in 97 or 98. And then, like, directly after that, um, the Breakthrough Project came together. Breakthrough Project was this, is this little organization that has been around the past 23 or so years that has just uh, tried to respond to, uh, like, incidents of, of racism and, um, well, just a bunch of, they, they just try and help out in the community. Or they've been trying to help out in the community over the past two decades. So... It was a little interesting how I just moved to Lodi and then all this stuff happens and it's almost like a snowball effect. And it, it really, it just seems like incident after incident after incident if you think about it because it was that, although I was only in grade school, I really didn't hear about it too much until later on when I was older. Although I did ask about the Martin Luther King Jr. Day and stuff. But then right after that, 
or shortly after that, maybe a year or so after that, a young girl was hit by a a huge truck right in front of our house when we lived on Wimbledon Drive. Um, some of you might have heard about it all over the news because it was a police officer who um, who who hit that girl. She ended up dying, and um, at that time, there were no fences all along the apartments, the apartment complexes, the oaks, which are along Wimbledon. So kids usually just played across the street on Wimbledon on the apartments and then the uh, duplexes and everything. And of course, Beckman School is right there, right behind the duplexes. So it's Beckman School, duplexes, Wimbledon, the oak apartments. And the little girl got hit right there on Wimbledon. And so I was still in elementary school when that when that happened. I didn't actually see it happen. I had just heard it, and then everybody started coming outside. I came outside, seeing what was going on. And then, of course, right after, well, I'm saying of course, but some people might not know. There are huge protests because it seemed like nothing happened to the person who hit the little girl. Um, I believe the result, well, I'm not even going to jump to the result yet. Um, So people just started protesting, and that was the first protest I joined. So it was something, I just saw an issue. We all saw an issue that the community wanted to be, wanted to get rectified in some way. And um, so we are even asking for small things like speed bumps because it is just a straight street. And then it's Harney Lane right there, and then Ham Lane. So there's usually a lot of speeders and everything. People speeding down Ham, speeding down Hutchins, and then they come down Wimbledon, they usually speed right there. And kids usually cross the street because, as I said, Beckman Elementary School is right there. So we just wanted speed bumps or something or maybe a sign. And it took, it seemed like months, but, you know, I I was a kid. It could have been like two weeks. I, I don't even know. But it seemed like forever. And I went out there day after day with some of my friends. Um... And we would hold up signs just telling people to slow down, keep it at 25 miles per hour because that's the speed limit when you're driving in uh, in normal neighborhoods. Um, they, never, they never put in speed bumps. They did put in signs that said 25 miles per hour, but no speed bumps. And then when I was going back out, when I, I'm running for city council this year, I started going back out to the neighborhoods, trying to talk with anybody that I could. And I went on the east side around Lloyd Street and it's pretty much like um, Cherokee is along here and then you go east and it's almost like a circle that's like Lloyd Street or whatnot and that area is just kind of behind the uh, the auto dealerships so it's just almost like ignored like nobody even really pays attention over there and um, I say that because even the businesses said they've worked there for like 20 years and the streets are the exact same that they've been they've never been repaired same with the sidewalks um the that little neighborhood the kids don't play in the street because people just speed down there because it's just a small circle in the in the back there's no stop signs there's no speed bumps or anything just kind of reminded me a little bit of that because we as a little neighbor community in on Wimbledon Drive got together asking for speed bumps or asking for something from the city and then I'm coming back like nearly 20 years later saying, what do you people need? If I get elected to the city as a representative, what do you people need for your community? And so it was a little a little crazy, you know, almost ending up where I started in a way. But um, back to that whole incident, um, I remember like one day a bunch of news stations were all out and there was just people all along Wimbledon Drive protesting, holding up signs saying 25 mile, miles per hour and everything. But the next day, everybody just disappeared. They just went on with their lives. And that was when I, even though that was like my first protests, that was when I learned that um, people just don't really keep up with some of the messages. Once they start protesting, they feel, oh, that's one protest is good enough. I'm done. And so people just stopped protesting, except for me and, like, my two friends. One of my friends I actually got in a little fight with at, in elementary school because, just because of our stupid stuff, we were kids. We were in elementary school. But then I apologized because it was really my fault. I ended up apologizing. We became friends, and he was one of the friends that 
sat with us saying 25 miles per hour. Um, anyways, so it was just me and two other people pretty much. And I also remember one other news reporter coming around and asking about it. And we we're like, yeah, you know, we're pretty much the only ones out here. There were protesters the other day and now nobody's, nobody's out here speaking with us anymore. Um, but when I went back to try and look for this information, I couldn't find it anywhere. It wasn't in the Lodi News Sentinel, even though they put up articles before the Lodi News Sentinel was even online, I think. Um, I tried to look just on Google because it was, like I said, it was an actual police officer from, I believe, from the Lodi Police Department that hit this little girl and killed her. And it seemed like there were no repercussions um, and then they allowed that officer to keep replaying that scenario along the street in front of all of our houses multiple times. And, um, because just to see if he was telling the truth, I believe they, he said that he was only going like 35 miles per hour, but he went so fast that they left huge streaks along the road. And even my mother said, that the sound she heard of the brakes locking up was something she had never heard before because he was going so fast. And then he hit her so hard that she died. And I believe, again, I just believe because I can't find the articles anymore, I believe that person just uh, got on house arrest or something of that nature. So, that, whoops. Um, that was a little bit of first bit of injustice maybe that, that I saw well actually I saw more even when I was younger growing up in Bakersfield but that was like uh, directly that I was connected with that I was hands on with although I didn't know the know the kid personally but it was something that we participated in as a community so um, anyways that's one of my main focuses I know a lot of politicians just come out and say I'm trying to help out the community I'm here for the people, but a lot of politicians are liars, and uh, I'm not a normal politician. Really, I keep saying that. I don't even know if I want a, hist or a, a future in politics. Sure, I've thought about it for a little bit. I also thought about being an astronaut when I was a kid, thought about being a fireman, but honestly, I don't know if I want a future in politics. I might just want to go into news, like journalism sort of stuff. But I still want to help out now at this time because we are still in a terrible situation in terms of our politics, our representatives, our laws, everything. We're still in the middle of this coronavirus pandemic. And some people might not say that. Many representatives might not say that. That it's just like pretend it didn't happen. We're just back to normal. Go on with your lives more or less. And I understand wanting to reopen everything. The need to reopen things to have schools reopen so um usually because parents need to go back to work and they need their kids to be looked after and then also they need that that hands-on interaction with uh, teachers some kids just can't learn online it just doesn't really connect um so my point is we are still right in the middle of this pandemic we don't know when this a possible vaccine or treatment might come estimates are the end of next year so we still have an entire other year and then this entire other year we are working off uh, let me just say 2021 throughout 2021 we will be working off the revenue of 2020 and remember the economy pretty much shut down in march of this year of 2020 so 2021 we are going to need people who know what they're doing and not just want to do the same old, same old. And also, I hate people who just want to jump in and say, yeah, I'm going to keep doing the same thing that everybody else, every, the past people did. Who, who wants to say that and who wants to vote for that? We do not stay the same forever. The world does not stay the same. People do not stay, stay the same. We always keep growing. We always keep progressing. And if we try to stay the same, we will get left behind. Um, but I don't, I don't know why I was... I, I don't mean to go on a rant sometimes, but sometimes I just do because, as Pastor Nelson said, we got that Latino passion in us. <laughs> um, so let's talk about some other issues that 
that I'm thinking about that I have been running on uh, for city council. Last time, yesterday, I was talking about the Hispanic representation, the district voting, all that sort of stuff. Um, I talked a little bit about homelessness. Um, so right now, I know there are a number of businesses out there, usually, mostly in the downtown area and then some in just the east side. So there's some District 4, District 5, even a little bit of District 3, all, in, all having to deal with the homelessness issue in their business areas. Um, so the businesses are mostly concerned uh, like with robbery and with break-ins, um, even just sanitary issues. And some of the homeless people that I have spoken with when I went to, over to Grace and Mercy or the Salvation Army, um, they would just say that, you know, we wouldn't go in, in the alleys if you just had some bathrooms open. Most of the times they shut down the bathrooms at the parks or they don't provide us with any uh sanitation stations, porto potties, whatever you want to call them. If you just provided us with them, we would use them. So that's a simple solution. And uh, the current Lodi government is doing that because, um, and, and they're not doing it with taxpayer monies. They they have actual funds from, from grants. And the grants come from the state. Sometimes they come from the federal level. And they're specifically designated for homelessness issues. And so... That is a simple, um, quick solution to, to reduce waste, to keep everything sanitary. You just provide some sanitation stations for those who have none available to them. And even you, you think um, a normal city would provide that for all residents. You know, just somebody, some a family's going out on a picnic in a park. Maybe they want to use the bathroom. Just have the bathrooms open for the entire family. Some cities, even including Lodi at some time in the past, shut down the bathrooms because they're like, well, we have homeless. We don't want the homeless in there. They need to use the bathroom just as much as anybody else. Don't be dumb. Anyways, continuing on the homeless issue. Um, but I understand that there are some homeless individuals who, um, who might constantly break the law on purpose. Not, not just like, oh, I was just taking a nap in the park. Leave me alone. You can leave those alone. I understand taking a nap in the park is technically illegal. You're not supposed to be camping out in the park, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about the the homeless individuals who break into businesses and steal stuff on a regular basis. The troublemakers or whatnot. Um, I have heard businesses and people just saying, we need to do something about those individuals. But because of the state's government and the uh, state requirements, we're not allowed to do anything unless the city provides enough beds for these homeless citizens. And while enough beds that match the amount of homeless citizens that are counted in the city at a specific time, I believe it is once a year. It, it might be a little bit more than once a year because they only count the census of normal people once every 10 years. But I don't quote me on that of when they count it. But at one time, they count all the homeless citizens in the city. And based on that number, I believe the state gives some sort of aid to the city based on that number. And the city cannot really um, like prosecute any homeless individuals unless there are beds and resources provided to those homeless individuals to pretty much uh, get their lives back on track. So the primary uh, solution, I guess you can say, to this homelessness issue is to have those beds provided. And we only have about half of those beds currently in Lodi, just at the Salvation Army. And really the Salvation Army is like the only, uh, the only shelter that Lodi has. We also have Grace and Mercy Charitable Foundation, but that is not a shelter. It provides a lot of services. It allows people to, to change different into different clothes, um, use a computer for job interviews, and uh, or not job interviews, but the application process. Um, it, they usually feed them about three times a week. Salvation Army does every night, I believe. Um, 
but yeah, the Gr Grace and Mercy Charitable Foundation just helps out quite a bit. I volunteered, I think, twice. Definitely going to go back. It's just, just helping out. I don't know. It's just something that, like, cleanses your soul or something. It's hard to explain. But it could just be me. Um, so anyways, uh, sanitation stations, we need beds. Uh, the beds, as I said, beds, we only have about half at the Salvation Army. So the goal or the plan from the current city representatives and those on the homelessness committee or committee of homelessness, whatever you want to call it, which apparently isn't an, an official committee because, because um, so the city government structure has the city council and everything, but there are also boards and commissions and committees and everything that citizens can apply to. And then they like volunteer their time for um and then you know it helps out in different parts of the city to just keep us all on track and to get things flowing um but those that are like actually part of the city you have to be appointed to those by the city council you can't just join on to the to, onto a board or committee just willy-nilly you have to get appointed by the city council so um so I guess apparently the homelessness committee isn't an official committee. And so I guess you don't get appointed to that committee. I don't know. It is. It was a little confusing. But anyways, the current plans for the committee of homelessness and some of the city council was that they were going to um, create some tiny homes, which are just like one bedroom, small homes. And only... Um, I always kind of like blank out on the word permitted, authorized, certified um, homeless individuals, those who went through the Salvation Army and other um, services, homelessness services, once they get like approved and some sort of certification or like sort of kind of like a back background check, but not really a background check. Once they get approved, then they get to be put in these tiny homes so they can really have a foundation to build their life off off of. Um, as I said, it's just a one-bedroom home, so it might just be one person. might be one person with their kid or two kids or whatever. Some people just live out of their car and uh, work that way. They might have escaped a, a bad relationship, and they end up homeless because they have to live out of their car. They have nowhere else to go. And so this tiny home might be something that provides that that foundation for them if they've been homeless for some time. I believe it's more for the chronically homeless. But... um. It is technically permanent housing, but it is also technically transitional housing. So they're not like, they're not kicked out. They do not have a time limit in these tiny homes. But most people usually don't want to just stay in these tiny homes. They do want to keep, they do want to move out and move forward and build off of their lives. So they don't see these tiny homes as the end solution is just another hand up. Um... But the tiny homes were just a handful of small homes for a handful of the homeless citizens. Um, I believe they're only approving like eight and wanting to expand to not even 20, not even 20. And at this time, at this current count, there were 139 homeless citizens. So the tiny homes wouldn't have even really put a dent in the population it's just more of a little hand up for those who have really gone through all these services and still haven't gotten that that uh well the hand up again still haven't gotten the assistance the little boost that they truly need because it can be tough and very expensive in california or they might just not have that path that's offered to other people so the tiny homes were just a little a little something something the main plan is to have a no bar or low bar shelter with more beds so the city has enough beds for all the homeless citizens and then they can uh, do the the other methods that they want. The other, uh, I don't know what you would call it. So they can enforce the law where they would like to all around the city because they can't really enforce the law without having enough beds for the homeless citizens. And also... It's set to be, or it was kind of decided to be a no bar or low bar homeless 
shelter by the city council and by the city manager because the Salvation Army does provide beds for free and everything, but there are rules that you have to follow. You can't bring in any animals. A lot of people have dogs or whatever that they take with them. So what are they going to do with it? Just leave it out. Say, see a dog. I'm going in, into this bed. No, that's that's their little fur baby, you know? So that's one rule and why people usually don't go into the, uh, to the beds, to the Salvation Army. Another rule, of course, you have to be sober. Some people... Some people are just addicted to drugs or alcohol. Some people just want a little something. They're not necessarily addicted, but they don't want somebody enforcing rules on them, saying you can't drink any alcohol, you can't do any sorts of drugs if you stay here. So they're like, okay, well, I'm not going to have you as my parent or my guardian or whatever. I, I know that you're offering me a bed. That's very nice of you, but I would prefer to stay off on my own with my own independence. I'm sure most people can understand having that independence and freedom, especially as an adult. <clears throat> Another rule, if you go to the Salvation Army, is you have to be split based on your gender. If you're going with a significant other who's of the opposite gender, you can't be with them. You have to, women go on one side, men go on the other side. So, yeah, some people just don't want to be split up from their friends, you know? It's, there are many reasons on why people don't go to the, to the Salvation Army's homeless shelter. And then even if they do go to the homeless shelter, they're, they have to leave by the morning. So where do they go? They don't have a home. Sometimes they don't have a job. Sometimes they can't hold down a job or sometimes they're still looking for a job. So they go out and around the city or whatnot. And then how do you get a job if you don't have a phone? Well, we provide free phones now. The government provides free phones. But then you also usually usually need an address. And then would you hire somebody who looks all dirty and hasn't taken a shower or something? Salvation Army does provide that. But again, you have to follow those rules. There are other services. Um, where is this? I left this down here. I kind of brought it up yesterday. There are other services that Lodi does offer, because Lodi is very generous, believe it or not. Although some of the citizens of Lodi might be a little uh, negative towards homeless individuals, the uh, government of Lodi is actually very generous, and there are many organizations that have helped out a lot of homeless citizens. Um, and I met, even met with some ver veteran services and um, other health, mental health insurance services. There were some people that just drove out to Grace and Mercy and try to sign up people to uh, to get on Social Security and veteran services and mental health services and everything. Um, but yeah, this just little homeless services and Lodi pamphlet I still have. And there is a little um, PDF sort of file on Lodi.gov. You just go to Lodi.gov and then go on that little drop down menu and there should be an option that specifically says homelessness and it'll t tell you um, some issues about homelessness excuse me <clears throat> um, what was it called showered with love I believe it was called um, it's like this mobile shower service mobile shower truck that um, provides haircuts and showers to homeless citizens. I don't believe it's even on here. Hmm. But I have seen them, um, seen their flyers all over. I am following them on Instagram, but I don't see it here. But the primary uh, thought process of um, helping out homeless individuals is to just um you can't just say get out of here leave our city because you have to think about freedom our rights of american citizens of california citizens um but there are still laws and regulations like you can't camp out in the park uh you can't park in a certain area for a certain amount of time so my thoughts well the city's thoughts was um the low bar no bar homeless shelter which would be next to the tiny homes, which should both be 
next to all those homeless services, which are usually around the east side, which is the, which is the Salvation Army, the Grace and Mercy Charitable Foundation, other mental health services, other clothing services, um, just things of that nature. So the, the thought process was having all those all next to each other pretty much on the east side. But a lot of citizens really don't want that whole segment or section for homeless citizens in that area. I believe it was supposed to be uh, Tom Chapman Park was the original plan. Citizens heard of that and were like, no, no, we don't want that. We don't want that there. There were a lot of, uh, a lot of negative messages and letters to the city council, so the city council didn't approve it. And I think the funds, the millions of dollars that were given to us by the state government and everything was just going to expire because they didn't have any plans. They didn't do anything with it. And so the money just expires. That's a little disappointing from, uh, from our government because you think they would have had some plans or backup plans or backup plans, back up the backup plans or something instead of just like, uh, well, there goes the money. But anyways, the, uh, the main purpose is to just provide some services to those to those that are not well off and then hopefully they can you know get their lives in order but there are uh drug re rehabilitation services and alcohol alcohol rehabilitation services also in this whole pamphlet my um long-term goal along with some others who are running would be to have a uh like a navigation center sort of thing my thought was just calling it a day center which would probably be next to all these services over on the east side so it would be kind of like a one-stop shop almost but maybe if we did like a one-stop shop sort of thing this navigation center or this day center then it wouldn't necessarily have to be on the east side because it would have all those services on this one spot but at the same time, you can't really just expect Salvation Army or Grace and Mercy Charitable Foundation to just get up and move their whole their whole operation, you know? But as I was saying, the long-term goal is a day center or a navigational center to have all these services so all the homeless citizens, all the homeless individuals would be able to go to this navigation center to get the help that they need, whether it's the mental health services, even just signing up for some mental health services, whether it's drug and alcohol rehabilitation, or there's just charging their phone so they can, you know, uh, call their, what do, you, what do you call that? Job, uh, uh, I, mean, I want to say appointments, but it's not a, really a job appointment. They're job opportunities. Sometimes I just blank on these words, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, they just need their phones charged so they can call their job opportunities. and their, Or maybe um, maybe they do have a job and they need to call in sick or something. Or they need to call the, a, another doctor. You need to make an appointment for a doctor. I don't know. They need phones sometimes. And then there's just not really pay phones all around. You can't just ask for some change and use the pay phone outside anymore. You have to think with the changing times. Um, and then those who do get a job might not be able to, um, to have somewhere to store all their items. Some of their clothes. Maybe some food that they have or other trinkets. So my thought is with this day center to just have some lockers to have pers to have people have a little bit of privacy storage for their items while they're at work, while they're trying to improve their lives, move forward, step forward. Here's a little security so you don't have to worry about your stuff getting stolen from other homeless individuals because that's that's what they have told me. They're worried about it getting stolen. And of course, some homeless individuals are homeless because they just have really bad mental health issues and um they might just need that medication which might be daily medication but you cannot just give somebody a month's worth of medication and then be like there you go go back out on the street with all these other people some of these other people who might be addicted to drugs or have some drug problem you can't expect that person who has this whole month's supply of of drugs and a mental health disorder to be able to to just take their medication or keep their medication safe. So another solution or thought process is this day center to provide the uh, prescription medication on a daily basis 
for homeless individuals without having to be um, institutionalized. Because really, that was one of the main um, arguments on why they took away a lot of mental health services all those decades ago. Because apparently, some people were getting institutionalized against their will. And um, again, that goes into the whole argument over freedom and your liberty, your rights as American citizen. And then where that goes into a line, where the, where's the line drawn once you have some sort of mental disability? And then which mental disability qualifies you for not having certain rights or liberties or whatnot? They've already, they as in representatives, have already talked about lots of this when it comes to being registered to vote. You cannot be registered to vote if um, you have certain mental disabilities. Um... So navigation center, day center, all those options for homelessness. What else? Um, talked about coronavirus. Oh yes, um, I've talked to or I've mentioned police reform a little bit. People hear that police reform and then they're like, "Oh my god!" Their ears shut, their eyes shut, they freak out. But reform isn't necessarily bad. And I'm not saying defund, take away all their money or whatever. Any sort of defunding of a police department should be to just take away all those insane weaponry and giant tank-like vehicles or um, what are those called? I IFVs? No, I don't think it's an IFV. You know, those those Humvees more or less. Those were um, provided cheaply from the military to our police departments because they just had a ton of them because we have a huge military industrial complex that just keeps building more and more junk because somebody has to make money and remember a huge chunk of our budget our federal budget goes to the military what do they do with all this excess sometimes they just either give it or sell it cheaply to community police departments and in my opinion community police departments do not need that sort of artillery or hardware or whatever um, especially a small, small community police department like the Lodi Police Department. We're a three by four mile wide city. Do we need all these assault rifles and some Humvee or whatnot? We got a pickup truck, but that was used to just haul all the homeless trash or the trash from some homeless individuals. So any sort of defunding, in my opinion, would be to reduce militar militarization and to have police more community oriented. I'm not thinking about reducing police funds in any other way. So if you've heard that, it's just scare tactics. But let's talk more about reform. And it ties a little bit into the homelessness issue, which I've been talking about. Because um, even the police that I've talked about, or even the police that I've talked with, said they don't want to deal with the homelessness issue. It's just kind of thrown on them. And some of them just don't really know how to deal with some of the homeless individuals. As I said, some have mental health problems. Some um, some are addicted to drugs. And so over the past 30 years or so, we've just been throwing more and more on our police to, to take care of drug-related problems, drug abuse, homelessness, um, mental health issues. Instead of having, uh, instead of investing in mental health services and I know people say oh it's expensive we can't do it don't say can't I've been told my entire life don't say can't that you always can do something but if you keep saying you can't do it then you never will you have to at least try anyways you could have at least started investing in some of these mental health services instead of just giving more and more money and hiring more and more police officers who just go through some police academy and are expected to know how to deal with all mental health situations or even homeless individuals um so as i was saying a lot of police officers just don't want to deal with this homeless situation they've said a homeless person sees an officer in their suit with a badge and it just they start panicking it doesn't make the situation feel any better so a solution is not have police respond to calls for homelessness but to have mental health workers respond to to calls for homelessness or community-based policing respond to homelessness calls. It also depends on the call, of course. If there's 
some sort of violent call, then they would need some sort of backup from police. And um, in instances across the United States in cities that have some sort of mental health response or some community-based response team, instead of the police responding, responding to homelessness or mental health cases, if they need to, they can have the police with them. It is not only mental health workers, no police ever. That's not how it works. It is if they need the backup, a lot of times they don't need the backup because you can talk to nurses and not even nurses, but like, um, what's the term? See, see something. Ah, uh, but it's, they're not, they're not at the educational qualifications of a nurse, I guess. They didn't go through all the training just yet, but they still, uh, they still help out in hospitals. I can't think of the, the employment. Anyways, my point is they already deal with a lot of individuals. Some are homeless, some have mental health and they don't, they don't respond to it using a monopoly of violence or force like the police do. And that is why people usually want to take the police away from that sort of situation and bring in people who are more situated, more familiar with dealing with uh, those sorts of issues. Drug, drug assistance, as I mentioned before. So um, they can actually have a conversation with them. They can guide them to the proper services. They can do a lot of different things. The solution isn't tackling them, handcuffing them, throwing them in the cold tank or whatever you call it, which is just overnight because they have to be released the next day. Um, well, when they're homeless. So when you're, when you're looking at these problems and finding solutions, you cannot find a solution that's a, just a quick solution because oftentimes, like just throwing them in jail, oftentimes that just is a surface level solution. It doesn't go to the root of the problem. And if you want to solve any problem, you have to go to the root of the problem and figure out why all this stuff is happening. And as I said before, with homelessness, there is not a single cause. There's not a, one... There's not one large cause. There's not a single cause overall. There are many reasons on why people are homeless. As I said, could be low wages, not very many job opportunities, especially now with the whole coronavirus pandemic and the governor is forcing a lot of uh, businesses to remain shut. Could have mental health disorders. They could have drug problems, alcohol problems. They could just be running away from a bad situation and have no alternative home to go to there are a lot of reasons um to be homeless so you have to look at all of these problems and find various solutions and just locking them up or putting them on a bus out of the city isn't a solution <clears throat> uh what else A little bit more about policing, police reform. Hmm. I'm not sure because it was mostly about like mental health and that sort of thing. Because as I mentioned, um, over the past 30 years, it's just been changing. And I've been reading all these articles from people in the police, sergeants, on the county level, even our own current chief of police here in Lodi, Lodi, California, he has written his own op-eds in the Lodi News Sentinel, saying pretty much the same thing that I'm saying. Um, well, we're already, we already got the ball rolling on ha having the Lodi Police Department working with some organizations. Oh, that reminds me. One of my other thought processes was just getting the uh, Lodi Police Department to do more community-based interactions. Um, I have also mentioned some of my background experience is um, helping out with some of the national night out gatherings in the neighborhood, helping um, doing like little neighborhood watch list with phone numbers and just uh, keeping in, in contact with everybody. That's, um, that's usually in August, early August, 
so when the neighborhood comes together and does like a little block party we also have a little neighborhood gathering on halloween in this in this neighborhood so i've helped out with that um the point i i'm saying this is because usually on national night outs in august when the neighborhood comes together the police usually come and then uh, meet with each neighborhood for the national night out gatherings and so if i were to go in city council well even if i'm not going to city council i probably would still push this whole thought of national night out on other neighborhoods uh throughout lodi because we've we've seen us um some pretty positive results i guess you can say from having a, a neighborhood watch because i'm not even sure how many years ago several years ago we had like a lot of theft a lot of break-ins whether it's the cars even some of the houses i'm not i don't remember if the mailbox has gotten broken into <clears throat> But I have heard many other mailboxes have been broken into uh, throughout District 5. So that's definitely a concern. And an another reason why I want um, want like some community-based or mental health-based services, social workers, nurses to deal with some of those other calls and to have the police focus on the more criminal aspects and the more violent aspects in law enforcement so we can you know tamp that down any sort of criminal activity like theft from the mailboxes which is a federal offense by the way um anyways going off on another rant uh, my point is we need to do more uh, community-based stuff neighborhood gatherings community-based neighbor neighborhood gatherings for national night out as i have done i want to promote that throughout lodi as more lodi neighborhoods can do and i want the police to come to all of these different national night out national night out gatherings but i think it is important for the police officers that normally uh patrol the area to go to that specific neighborhood so they can be familiar with the faces and the people and just be more connected to the community police police department um sometimes the fire department does come out for the national night out they usually do for our neighborhood but the fire department's like right right there fire station number three and I believe they're, they are working on a fire station number four or five. I forget which one around the um, the Costco area, the Borchard Elementary School area. So I believe they are planning on doing another fire department somewhere around there so they can just have more services, more community-based services and everything. Um, but um, the police need to the police should be more interactive with the community and um when i when i was over in stockton because i've gone to school over in stockton over at delta college um sometimes i would go to some police or i did go to a police event which was in the park just earlier this year um with some with some other classmates of mine and so they it, it was fine i thought you know the police just interacted with a bunch of normal normal citizens and some children and children asked questions we were able to ask all these sorts of questions and we found out a lot of interesting information directly from the police they had um, hot dogs chips and sodas and everything and then they had a little paddy wagon that you can take pictures in and um you can see their their motorcycles and their huge vehicles and all that sort of stuff so it was this whole event in the park in the afternoon that everybody can just come out and meet the police with and i heard all right you know i i found out that lodi's police department finally did something today where uh, the where the police department can meet with the community but it was from like 9 30 in the morning till or it was like 9 a.m till 10 30 a.m or something this morning so of course some people were sleeping some people were at work some people were at school i had school um so i didn't go and I, I i would definitely like to go and you know be more interactive with the police so everybody can be more on the same page as a community it's a small community lodi california is like a little over sixty thousand in the population three by four miles as i said before um amount of police officers i believe it's around the hundred hundred mark something like that so anyways i just want uh, the police officers to be more proactive with the community and i want the community to, i want the community to be a little bit more proactive 
with policing, maybe a little bit more community-based policing, just a little bit more neighborhood watch, which might result in more Karens, yes, but sometimes just speaking with your neighbors, knowing your neighbors, doing it that way is a lot better than calling the police and waiting for them to come around and then hoping that they do come around and um, solve any issue that might might be might be prevalent at the time. I don't know. And, then, and there might not even be an issue. It might just be some some person who's visiting his friend coming around and then you call the police on him because he's not normally around the area. You know, there are some downsides to community policing, of course, but then there are a lot of upsides. And it's to deal with it with yourself. Or deal with it yourself as a community instead of just calling the police all the time. You do call the police on certain instances. You don't just go investigate all instances yourself. All suspicious instances. You know, hmm, this is a bit suspicious. Let me go investigate it myself. Sometimes you might want to call the police. Um, what else? I've talked about homelessness, COVID-19, criminal justice reform, mental health assistance a little bit. You know, we have, we have like two cops designated at high schools around Lodi. And I think another cop that's just that just drives around that's still dedicated to the schools. Don't quote me on the numbers, but I'm pretty sure it is really low in that in that area. I'm often worried about having police officers in the schools. I know some people are are for that, especially after hearing a lot of school shootings uh, throughout the country. But um, I'm just not sure how effective having a police officer on one or two campuses in Lodi, how effective that really would be. Of course, there are only really two high school campuses in the city of Lodi, so they can just have them on those two high schools. But, um, and they are on opposite sides of the city. But still, the city is only three miles wide, as I said. How long does it take to get to the city? From the police department or from your from your patrol i mentioned that because i just have seen a lot of stories about police officers just being a little too forceful or abusive to students who are just children of course their, their minds haven't fully developed and also i just don't think having a police officer there would really do much because that might just police officers are just about squashing the power handcuffing them or whatnot and I wouldn't want them to be put into the system if they just got in a little fight in high school I've gotten in fights in high school and in middle school well no it wasn't high school it was just middle school and what if they just threw me in the system or what if I had a record because I, I got in a little fight in high school I think that's stupid they're still children and they shouldn't have some record that just creates that school to prison pipeline that affects the opportunities that people have later in life because then they see oh this person has a record i don't know if i want to hire him i don't know if this person doesn't really pass the background check because they got in a fight when they're 13 or 14. that's that's just one of the reasons or those are some of the reasons why i'm worried about having police in school and why i would rather have social workers or nurses being paid for in the schools as opposed to police officers if the city is going to pay for something or somebody to watch the children have it be social workers or nurses. Again, I understand the thought process that it's police might be there for to, or to prevent mass shootings. But I would hope we would have some other um, some other option. Some other resolution other than, you know, just a police officer to just take them out because that's what they would be doing. To just take out the high schooler. And they also got to look out for all the other students and make sure that they take out the right one, which is very troubling to think about. Um, well, I've been live streaming for an hour, so I just want to end this live stream on one more thing, one more issue that is very important to me, which I noticed right away when I jumped into the race, which is there are no term limits for city council members, and we do not vote in the mayor of Lodi, California. So... We just switched to by district elections, so that is a, a good step in the right direction, more, bringing more representation 
to uh, citizens of Lodi, allowing more people to actually run for office. So my thought is, if I were to become part of the city council, is to push for, well, first I would bring it forth to the city council and the people of Lodi. I'm not just going to push it in. I want to discuss it with the people, with some town halls and, and, and whatnot, um, saying that I think we should have term limits on both the mayor and the city council members, possibly three term limits for the city council and two term, li term limits for the mayor, and to have the mayor an actual separate seat that we actually vote in. Because right now, the mayor is just kind of appointed or rotated in by one of the city council members. So you get elected by the people as a city council member, but then you're appointed to the mayor as a city council member. So you're part city council member and part mayor for one year. And you're not elected or anything of that nature. I would like it so the mayor is actually elected. But everything else can be the same. Mayors still get one vote. Mayors cannot veto them unless we could talk about it in a town hall. Do you guys want mayors to have veto power or whatever? I think that would give mayors too much power. Let mayors have the same powers as the city, city council members maybe. But still, I want the mayor to be a separate seat that is voted in, elected by the people of Lodi. The entire city of Lodi can vote in the mayor, but the select districts can vote in the select district representative for the city council. And then we should have term limits of four years for the mayor because we have term limits of four years for the city council members. So... Well, that's, it's a term, not really a term limit. We have terms of four years, and then we have term limits, three limits, I mean three terms for city council, total of 12 years, two limits, or two term limits for mayor, total of eight years, combined total of 20 years. You serve 20 years in the city government. That's an entire generation. It's time to let the next generation step up and take hold of the reins and bring in their ideas for the next the next step, the next generation, and their children that they need to look after. Instead of having the representatives look out for their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, or whatnot. Because that is, that was one of the, uh, the letters that I heard when, um, when the city council was deciding on whether they should have the homeless shelter and the tiny homes over at the Ch Tom Chapman Field. The city council or the city council staff had said that Tom Chapman Field is rarely ever u rarely ever used for baseball or anything, so that's why it was being looked at, and it was public land as a park. It was owned by the city, so we didn't have to purchase purchase land to put the tiny homes on. And they said it wasn't really being used, and one of the letters that was sent from a citizen of Lodi to the city to the representatives, city council representatives, was something of the nature of, do you representatives have children of yourselves? Are, or are you just so old that you only have grandchildren and you don't even realize that this field is being used quite often, like weekly at least, on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis? And then there was just another message put out by the city hall, city council saying, oh, it was, we'll, we'll be looking into it. Our staff was looking into it. It was our staff. It wasn't really us or something of that nature. But uh, yeah, the, the city representatives should be more in tuned and connected with their citizenry that they're supposed to represent. That's what I hope to do. I hope to be a great representative of the people to be connected to hear everything from those people in district five well even from any district i want to hear from every district but i would be the representative of district five so you can email me if you live in district five and be like hey man i need this this is an issue i want the city to take care of this the city should probably take care of this even one of my neighbors who's been one of my mentors he's i believe 83 retired osha so safety is very important to him he was like, you know, you see these power lines all around here? The power lines should be buried. They are way too low. They're a hazard. And then some crews that go and cut the trees, they usually have to go in between the power lines, which is a huge hazard. Over in Sacramento, there was a, a worker who was just killed a month or two ago touching the power lines. It was an accident, of course. But we can prevent that by just burying the power lines. Sure, it might be another cost. But it's better to just be proactive 
instead of having to pay for somebody's funeral costs or some sort of insurance costs. And I also met with um, uh, Terry Clark, who is who now owns the Sunset Theater. He's um, and Alexander's Bakery, which have uh, been closed down, and he's renovating those to make it like a community center for arts and theater and all that. And even to have it rent out for marriages, bar mitzvahs, all sorts of events. Um, he even mentioned that while he's restructuring everything, he wants to bury the power lines because nobody wants to go out there and have like some event and then you look to the right and there's just power lines right there. You know what I mean? So it's also an eyesore in turn and it's an eyesore and um, a little not environmental, but um, safety hazard. So just another another thing to look at. But so I'm, I'm just looking at very various issues. I'm hearing from my citizenry, from the people of Lodi, and I just want to be that sort of representative that looks out for the people. And of course, I'll be looking out for the businesses as well. But people are first and foremost because you can't even own a business if you're not a person, right? <laughs> you can't start a business if you're not a person. You need health. You need some safety. You need a family. Well, some people want to start a family. They don't need a family. They just want to start a family. And so that's the whole point of a, a city, a community, to come together, to be as one, to watch everybody's back, and to have the government look after everybody's safety and well-being. So I hope. I hope you will vote for me by tomorrow. Tomorrow's the last day. Tomorrow's election day. So if you live in District 5, please vote for Hector Madrigal for Lodi City Council. You can learn more about me at votehector.us or votehector.com. And I also have my own YouTube channel called The Olive Branch. Or you can go to my YouTube channel, which is just Hector Madrigal, Hector Madrigal. And you can just see some of my uh, thoughts and opinions, ideas, ideology, morals, beliefs over the past six years or so. So yeah, go check that out. And uh, you got y'all can also leave me questions, comments, thoughts, message, whatever. I always read them. Sometimes I respond to them. Most of the time I respond to them, even though people say stop responding to them. I'm like, no, they are citizens of Lodi. They deserve a response. <laughs> but anyways, that's pretty much it. Glad y'all can join me. Thank you for your time. And I'll see y'all later.